All right, Dr. Gregor, thank you for being on the channel. I really appreciate it. How you Happy doing? to be here. How you doing, man? Good. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I feel like this video is gonna be an interesting one, and I feel like there's gonna be a lot of people watching ready to nitpick everything away because there's a lot of anti-vegan arguments out there, and I feel like there'd be no better person to answer them than the famed Dr. Gregor himself. Happy to help. So you ready to jump into this? Let's do it. Okay, so the first question is, a lot of anti-vegans go straight to the anti-nutrient argument, which is you know a lot of plant-based foods have lectins, phytates, oxalates, and that cancels out the ability to absorb vitamins and minerals. What is your opinion on that? And what's your advice with that? It's ironic. I mean, you can't make a, you're not getting enough nutrition on a plant-based diet since of course, plants are where essentially all our nutrition originally comes from. Uh, but so for example, lectins, I've got a bunch of videos about Dr. Gundry's Plant Paradox, and I think the first video in the series on nutritionfacts.org is simply titled, uh, Dr. Gundry's Plant Paradox is Wrong. And I just go and enunciate and go through uh, all the reasons why. Um, I mean, well, the kernel of truth is that sure, you don't want to eat raw kidney beans, but it's not really even possible to eat raw kidney beans. They're right. little rocks. But if you soak them overnight, they'd get firm and rubbery, and then you could put them in a salad and make people really sick because of the lectins. But they're utterly destroyed by proper cooking. You can squash your bean with a fork. Then you don't have to worry about lectins. And the lectins in raw foods, like tomatoes, are completely harmless. In fact, in the second video of the series, you can talk about uh, potential anti-cancer benefits um, uh, which you particularly see in, in phytates, phytic acid. See, based on studies on puppies and rats done decades ago, it was considered an anti-nutrient in terms of absorption of calcium. But now we think of phytic acid, these phytates, as beneficial, having anti-cancer properties. We should go out of our way. We should not be soaking our nuts. Why? Because we might be losing phytates. We don't want to lose phytates. That's one of the benefits of eating nuts. So, uh... Um, and then uh, oxalates, um, uh, uh, there are a few high oxalate um, uh, sources. Um, so spinach, mm -hmm. Swiss chard, beet greens, you don't want to overdo those. Uh, okay. If you're following my recommendations to eat um, lots of greens. And so my uh, daily dozen recommendation is two servings of greens plus a serving of cruciferous vegetables, which could also be greens. If you're doing cups of day, cups as in plural, cups a day, you want to diversify your greens. You don't want to just do high oxalate greens like spinach, Swiss chard, and beet greens. You want to eat arugula and kale and collards, all those other wonderful greens. Um, and it's because you can get too many oxalates, you run into kidney stone problems, even if you uh, don't otherwise have any, uh, any uh, kind of predisposing factors. So you can check out my videos. I have a video series, of course, on oxalates and greens as well um, as with 2,000 other nutrition topics at nutritionfacts.org. So you would say that the absorption of calcium is not a problem because you're having oxalates when you're eating spinach and kale and all these, these dark greens and stuff? Oh, I mean, it's, you're not going to absorb the calcium. You don't go to spinach for calcium because it's stingy with the calcium because it's it's uh, it's combined to the oxalates but if you it's not like but if you made like a spinach kale pesto it's not like the oxalates in the spinach would somehow grab onto the oxalates in, uh, grab onto the calcium in kale it doesn't i mean it just binds up its own calcium so you just you get calcium from other low oxalate dark green leafy vegetables okay because one of the arguments is that if you're eating like tofu or something like that, that's calcium set, and that's how you're getting a good portion of calcium, but you're also having spinach with it. The spinach is going to stop you from absorbing the calcium from the tofu. Bullshit. Nice. Uh, but there are healthier sources of soy than tofu because it's relatively processed food. So tempeh or edamame or the whole soy foods, even better. Okay, nice. All right, so next up, the other biggest argument that I get, because my channel is you know, heavily fitness-based, muscle-based, things like that, so a lot of the arguments is that plant-based protein is inferior because of the amino acid profile. Specifically, the amount of leucine is lower in plant-based foods. So what's your response to that, and what's your advice? Thank God for that, because leucine increases the engine of uh, aging um, enzyme TOR, mTOR, 
Um, and I presume uh, there'll be a substantial discussion on my next book, How Not to Age, which should be out December 2022 on just that very uh, topic. And so for longevity's sake, we want to decrease uh, leucine intake. We want to decrease methionine mm-hmm. intake, also found concentrated in animal proteins. We want to decrease branching amino acid intake. We want to decrease, in fact, our essential amino acid intake across the board down to recommended levels instead of getting the excess protein, um, which uh, is associated with uh, cardiometabolic disease. Okay. So you would say that there's not an issue with getting enough leucine to be healthy on a plant-based diet, just for like an average person, maybe. The concern is getting too much leucine. Okay. I don't care about biceps. I right. care <laughs> about health and longevity because I'm a physician. But you would say like an average person who's not lifting wouldn't have to worry about their leucine intake. Oh, no one has to worry about getting sufficient leucine unless okay. you're living off cotton candy or something. Okay. All plant foods have all essential amino acids. There's only one food that doesn't have all the essential amino acids, and it's called gelatin, which is made of skin, bones, cartilage. It's an animal protein. So you, you, if you just lived off Jello, you'd die of protein deficiency, but that's not the case for plant proteins. The third biggest argument that I get from anti-vegans is about omega-3 and the fact that plant-based omega-3 sources are high, well, are entirely ALA, alpha linoleic acid, and our conversion of ALA to EPA and DHA is poor. Um, So what would your opinion and advice be on that one? So you need two things. You need conversion and you need to have a good source of ALA in the first place. And so I encourage that's one of the reasons why one of my daily dozen, this is my daily dozen checklist of all the healthiest of healthy foods out there, free app, iPhone and Android, of course. Uh, a tablespoon of ground flax seeds. That's one of the reasons that flax seeds are on there because it's a very concentrated source of ALA, alpha linolenic acid. Um, also walnuts, chia seeds, hemp seeds. There's a couple sources, but you want to get a, a few grams in a day because about 10% um, make it uh, are elongated in those long chain omega 3s. And we can facilitate that process by cutting down our intake of junky omega 6 rich oils, such as cottonseed oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil. And Cornell, some of these junky um, uh, processed food oils one might find. One can also just take long chain omega 3s pre formed um, in algae or yeast based EPA DHA supplements. I encourage people to consider taking 250 milligrams of pre formed DHA um, uh, every day. Okay. And so, would you say that the average person without taking a supplement is being deficient in omega-3 uh like because of the epa and dha uh for uh well we don't know yeah uh, but for long-term brain health particularly in men um i uh, until we know more i would suggest it because we actually have um randomized controlled trials where you supplement with dha and you actually get improvement in brain function suggesting that people aren't getting enough now of course you can get it from fish but along with fish comes because of how polluted our world has become. If you look at toxic heavy metals, PCBs, dioxins, the highest levels of most of these persistent organic pollutants are found in the aquatic food chain, right? Everything eventually flows down to the sea. All the mercury released from the coal plants in China eventually um, makes its way into uh, the aquatic food chain, builds up. Um, And so, wait a second, how can you get uh, omega-3s without the pollutants? The only way, I mean, it's the healthiest source for everybody would be um, either make yourself from uh, the short-chain fatty acids or um, take a preformed algae-based pollutant-free source. A plant-based source. Getting it directly where the fish would be getting it from in the first place that right. everyone touts. Right. These are essential I mean, essential fatty acids, meaning we don't make them. Fish don't make them either. Right. They have to get... Be, right. And so at the bottom of the food chain where they originally made these golden algae, right, we can just get that from a pure source. And I'm on the same page as you. I just wanted to point that out because that is one of the biggest arguments. Um, I read that there was a study in 2005 um, that in general, in America, North America, 72,000, 96,000 deaths occur that could be prevented from omega-3 deficiencies. Yeah. And that's not including, or like, you know, that is including vegans and non-vegans. So just like in general, I think a lot of people um, are maybe not getting their, their omega-3s correctly. Well, I, I'm presuming, particularly because it was such an old study, that they still thought that these long-chain omega-3s were heart-healthy. 
That has since been dismissed. If you look at the latest Cochrane review, which is the kind of the gold standard for evidence-based medicine, no significant benefit for all-cause mortality, heart disease prevention, anything. We don't take omega-3s for our heart. We take it for our brain. Last year was a heavy year of very popular YouTubers going ex-vegan. And then the thing that they say, a lot of them was saying, is that they had, you know, uh, some fish or they had their first you know, piece of steak or something like that. And they woke up the next day, their sexual functions were going back to normal. They were able to get erections. They were becoming lubricated. Their libido came back is one that I hear a lot. And I don't know. What do you, what do you have to say about that? Physiologically, I can't see how a fish stick is going to bring back your penis. I mean, I, so it's, I mean, see, it would seem psychological. I mean, there's something there. I mean, there's, uh, there's something called placebo effect, right? Where you get um, uh, beneficial effects that, because the, you're, you're imagining them to be beneficial effects from something that's actually nothing. There's a, the flip side of this is called a nocebo effect, where you can get negative effects from, so if I give you a pill and say, this is going to do bad things to you, yeah, you know, um, a lot of people who take this get a tummy ache and a headache. Um, you take it, even though there's nothing in it, it's a placebo, um, people report getting headaches and stomach aches. So it's negative effects from nothing. Um, and so someone who thinks that a vegan diet is going to do bad things to them, bad things can happen to them because, you know, it's like this mind over man. It's remarkable. You have someone to pill that says it's gonna, their heart rate's going to go up and their heart rate goes up. Right. And I mean, it's, and so we're not just talking subjective complaints like, you know, I don't know stomach upset or something. I mean, these are, you can do objective lab. I mean, you can get, you give somebody a milkshake and you tell them this is a decadent milkshake. Um, and you have a different uh, release of, uh, of these, these gastrointestinal hormones than if you give, tell them, say, this is a diet shake, there's no calories in it. It's same exact milkshake. I mean, it's absolutely remarkable how much power our brain, just our, our thoughts about things, can affect physiological function, immune function, things that we wouldn't think that we had any kind of conscious control over. And so, you know, you craving a, a, a burger um, and then getting your burger and it's like, oh, I got my burger back and, you know, whatever. Um, I mean, there's just, I can't think of a, of a physiological way. I mean, so, I mean, there's, look, if you if don't do uh, veganism right, you can get B12 deficient, not taking B12 supplement or eating B12 fortified foods. And B12 deficiency can lead to all sorts of horrible things, but a B12 deficiency, including sexual dysfunction, but a B12 deficiency isn't cured by one chicken nugget, right? I mean, you'd have to, I mean, in fact, I mean, you, I mean, you get B12 injections, you take high dose B12 for weeks to cure a B12 deficiency, to bring back your bone marrow and all these things. I mean, so... The fact, so I don't know, I, I haven't seen any of these things, but if they, but anyone who says there's some kind of instantaneous reaction, they like, you know, put the food in their mouth and all of a sudden they got a boner, it seems more psychological than physiological. Okay, that's what I figured you were going to say, because yeah, that, one of the people that I'm talking about specifically did say they had fish that night, then woke up the next morning and everything was feeling way different, you know, they were getting erections and things like that. So I figured you were going to say mind, mind over matter, basically, like they convinced themselves that they felt better the next morning because they had convinced themselves that the vegan diet was causing them to feel bad. So the first time they had something that wasn't vegan, it was going to be the cure. And then the next morning they woke up telling themselves it was the cure. Or it could have been a coincidence. I mean, there's all sorts of things. I mean, I mean, that's why we don't base life and death decisions on anecdotes or testimonials. We base life and death decisions on the science. And the science is clear for sexual function, plant-based diet, for longevity, health, preventing, arresting, reversing, all of our leading causes of death um, in terms of these lifestyle diseases, these chronic diseases. I mean, look, I mean, uh, sexual function relies on blood flow. How do you increase blood flow to the pelvic region? You do that by having healthy arteries. How do you have healthy arteries? There's only one diet ever proven to reverse heart disease, opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery, plant-based diet. A whole food plant-based diet. I mean, if that was the all a plant-based diet could do, reverse the number one killer of men and women, right? 
then you think it'd be the kind of the default diet until proven otherwise. And the fact that it can also be so effective preventing arrest and reversing other leading killers, type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming. All right. So vegan diet, eggplant emoji. Ha! <laughs> eggplant. Ugh, I hate eggplant. Gross. <laughs> healthy, but slimy. <laughs> But really healthy. Soluble fiber brings down your cholesterol. Yeah. I like baba ganoush, but uh, I just pretend there's no eggplant in it. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of eggplant either. It's not great. Now, I like okra. That's the crazy thing. And I like oatmeal. I like, uh, there's, it's not a slimy thing. I, it's something about, I don't know. Now we're getting into kind of like the less popular uh, arguments, but I still do hear these quite often. This more so comes from like the hardcore carnivore channels who are really, really fervent on, you know, calling out vegans and stuff. So this one is, um, a lot of them will say that veganism is causing vegans to age quicker. So their skin is aging quicker. Their skin is discolored or more pale over time. What's your response to that one? I mean, uh, the studies that have been done on skin health, um, where, I mean, the randomized control trials, so you t they took college students, randomized to eat more fruits and vegetables or not, got a significant improvement in um, rated uh, attractiveness and healthfulness and it's because we get this golden glow because the carotenoids and fruits and vegetables gets deposited in our skin I mean then we get this kind of rosy glow because we actually have more circulation to our face and so when you actually take people randomize them to a healthier diet and then put their pictures before and after to unbiased independent third-party observers and say who's more attractive um, who looks healthier um, it's not only um, in a cross-sectional basis those eating healthier rate higher in that way but you can actually over a few weeks um, significantly improve the attractiveness of uh, people and this is not just white Caucasian skin but it's done for Asians done for African Americans for any skin tone you can improve its healthfulness by eating um, uh, carotenoids, which are only found in fruits and vegetables. Okay, that, that's a great scientific answer. So here's my perspective on it. <laughs> I just think that, so like when I went vegan, I was eating, before I was vegan, I was eating really poorly. I was eating like lots of frozen meals and stuff like that. I was drinking tons of like whey protein, getting like my, my calories and my protein from like uh, protein bars and mass uh -huh. gainers. So not the highest quality foods, but I also didn't care. People would be like, oh, you know, that's filled with preservatives. And I'd be like, well, yeah, it's preserving me. <laughs> You know, so, you know, kind of like that whole, like, ah, don't worry about it type of thing. Mm. Over time, as I went vegan, I started to eat more whole foods. I started to eat more vegetables. I started to learn about things that I didn't care about before. So I think part of it maybe come from the fact that as people become more health conscious, I think they take away some of their bad habits. So like, for example, for me, I didn't go tanning, like to the tanning salon mm. because, you know, I just looked more into it and I cared more about my health great. versus just the fact that I wanted to like look great all the mm -hmm. time. So I think maybe some of it might come from maybe that specific thing. People not going out oh, in the sun oh, as I much. See. Yeah, in, yeah. In, in, yeah, yeah. Increase your risk of melanoma, the deadliest skin cancer. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, look good. Yeah, in, from the inside out rather right. than exposing yourself to ultraviolet radiation. There have been a lot of ex-vegans, uh, like I mentioned earlier, who in the last year made videos and, and then now are making videos about how the carnivore diet is making them mm. so much better and everything's mm. feeling so much better. Mm. Um, and all the things that, that, you know, even that weren't vegan that were causing them issues like mold and whatnot, none of those things matter anymore. It's the carnivore diets cured them and stuff. And I don't know, what would you say when it comes to ex-vegans? Uh, why do you think that they feel like the vegan diet was the thing that wronged them and then this new diet is the thing that's that's curing them well man i think everyone loves to hear you know good news about their bad habits i mean who doesn't want to be told that uh, i mean i don't know like if there was an excuse to like you know you know eat bacon and ice cream all day i don't, I don't know i mean um and so uh, i mean I mean, who, I mean, who knows? I mean, in each, in each of these individual cases, look, if somebody has a, um, if someone had a soy allergy, for example, right, never had a block of tofu in their life, and they, I mean, you know, and so all of a sudden, they, you know, become vegan and start eating blocks of tempeh, fantastic, but they're the one in eh, 200 or so people that have a soy allergy, all of a sudden they feel like crap. They, but in their mind, they stopped eating meat, and they legit feel like crap. 
I better get back. And then they go back to me and they feel better. It wasn't the meat that was making them feel good. It was the fact that they happen to have an intolerance or allergy to something. That, so you always have to ask, well, what are you eating now that you weren't eating then? And so, you know, if you had any manner of uh, intolerance, whether it's celiac disease where you couldn't eat gluten-containing grains, um, and then all of a sudden if you just eat, you know, if you just ate steak all day, well, you'd have no contact with something that might be calling intolerance. But of course, that's not the answer. The answer is finding out what's causing your problem. You can do these exclusion diets where you basically stop eating everything except uh, water, tapioca, and sweet potatoes, which essentially nobody has any problems with. And presumably your symptoms go away if it indeed is some food intolerance. And then you start adding back foods and you see what causes it. And you're like, oh, it's the carrots. I never had carrots in my life, but all of a sudden I started eating carrots. And, oh, all right, whatever. And so then you just, you're, you, then you eat a whole food plant-based diet without carrots. And then you got the best of all worlds. Um, but, you know, look, anyone who doesn't feel good on any diet should go to their freaking doctor and figure out what's going on. Um, and the only thing one really has to seriously be concerned about on a plant-based diet is getting a regular, reliable source of vitamin B12. Otherwise, you can end up uh, paralyzed, demented, or dead. Okay. That's There's a happy note! <laughs> but serious shit, right? Right, How right. bad? Okay, so there was, a, there, was a, there was an article published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the most prestigious medical journal on the planet. Yeah. You know what it's called? Blindness in a vegan. How did that do for the movement? We can't do this. We can't have people screwing it up for everybody else right. because they're stupid and making us all look bad. Yeah. Right? Everybody needs to get their B12. So, yeah, that's, that's how I feel about the whole, the whole ex-vegan thing is every time an ex-vegan happens, everybody gets comments on there. My page gets filled with comments about, oh, well, did you see this person's video? Clearly, you're also going to have brain fog or have you experienced any libido issues or anything like that? And so I feel like what you just said is a pretty good point. Like, um, beyond even ex-vegan like YouTubers and people who have a lot of people following them, just people who tried a plant-based diet and then they said it didn't work out for me, I think what you're saying is a good point. Maybe there was something specifically in the diet that didn't work with them. Like if they had a gluten intolerance or something like that, and they should maybe do like a reverse diet, like you're saying, like a exemption diet where they're seeing how they do without this, how they're doing without that and maybe reconsider. Yeah. I, or they're eat, maybe they're eating crap. Yeah. I mean, these yeah. days, see, it used to be, see, when I started out, patient came to me, said they're a vegan then I knew, oh, you, you shop in the produce aisle, right? Now someone comes to me, they're vegan. Oh, all they do is eat vegan donuts all day. Yeah. And, you know, slam, you know and, and living off beer, french fries, and impossible whoppers. You can be as unhealthy as you want as a vegan these days, right? That's what, yeah, you actually have to eat your vegetables, damn it. Right, yeah. And, and then nobody says uh, the mass amount of people that are filling the hospitals prove that you shouldn't eat an omnivore diet but the, the hospitals are filled with omnivore people absolutely who are dying from diseases directly linked to these bad foods in fact the number one cause of death in these united states is the american diet bumping tobacco smoking to number two to cigarettes only kill about a half million americans every year worse our diet kills many more so the last thing you want to do is start eating like everybody else can I get a little extra bonus question? Bonus question. Let's do it. Not so much anti-vegan, but I get this one probably the most common when it comes to people who are trying a vegan diet. They're saying it's not working too well for them. They'll say that everything that they eat bloats them on a vegan diet. Do you have like advice for bloating? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, it's just their microbiome. Okay. I mean, so they, I mean, their they're, they're good gut bugs are, are meat-eating bugs. Um, just not used to eating fiber. I mean, your fiber feeders, maybe, you know, I need to ramp up and be able to take care of that. And so you just got to start slow. I mean, some people have a gut microbiome that can switch really quick, mm -hmm. switch on the dime. Mm -hmm. um, but other people, literally, we're talking like a spoonful of chickpeas a day, and then two spoonfuls of chickpeas. They really have to go up slow. Not everyone can go kale quinoa overnight. That's really cool. I, I like that. So you just got to give it time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, but I mean, that's what that's the kind of microbiome you want. Yes. Because you're feeding these bad bugs are making, you know, TMAO, all these horrible things that are doing bad things to you. You want those fiber feeders, but they don't go from zero to 60. Right. Right. Um, they're crowded out by all the bad bugs. You have to slowly feed them. They get fruitful, multiply, crowd out all the bad bugs. And eventually you get the best of both worlds. 
You know, it's important to recognize that we evolved even like eating like 100 grams of fiber a day based on, you know, uh, coprolites, these po the paleo poo, like fossilized human feces. We're talking 100 grams. We're lucky here in the United States, the average is about 15, 15, right? Um, so our bodies were, just, and so and the average, and the recommended minimums are all 30. Put people on a really healthy plant-based diet, maybe able to get 60. Put people on like a rural African, rural Asian diet where they don't have these chronic diseases. Um, you know, that, then they're getting like, you know, 70, 80, 100. Um, uh, and so, I mean, yeah, that's where we really should be. Um, but, you know, we gotta, you know, it may take a while to ramp up slowly. Some people can do it really quick, but if you're having problems with gas, bloating, just take it slow. It doesn't matter what you eat today, tomorrow, what means, it matters what you eat in the next few decades. So you gotta do it at whatever pace will get you there for the long run. Yeah, long term vision, not short term trying to eat like your favorite YouTuber who's eating 120 grams of fiber a day. If you can do it, <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, there's no reason you got to go slow. Look, right? But if you're like, oh, but yes. all right, yeah, then you got to, yeah. Then take it slow. That's right. All right. Well, that was awesome. I really appreciate you being on here. So happy to help. Keep up the good work. I know you have a, a new book. So do you want to? Mention that real quick, how yeah, people can get how that. How Not to Diet yep. came out number two New York Times bestseller. Awesome. Very excited. Congrats. Um, doing very well. Um, and, uh, of course, all the proceeds I receive from all my books are all donated to charity. I just want everyone to have access to this life-changing, life-saving information. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on here. I really appreciate it, man. And uh, I'll see you probably pretty soon. Absolutely. Let's do it again. All right.